Come to say good day right here.
Morning, Hope Church. Or, uh, I don't know, early afternoon, late morning, 10 o'clock, I don't know. Where is that? Um, this morning, uh, Rock the Ridge t-shirts out front, $10, $5, $2, $1. Um, there's no profit for the church. We're just trying to push these. Uh, we talked about last week about sending the church to relatives, friends all over, bringing pictures back, putting them up on Facebook, something fun to do. Um, we also talked about this last week too. Walter Hansford's been sick and in the hospital. So we want to make sure that we remind people to keep Walter and his wife Carol in your prayers. Um, I guess the last couple of days he hasn't been feeling too good. So we just want to remind people on that. Um, Shore program for the homeless started last night. And we had like four people and had a dinner. I guess everything went really well. So we're going to continue that on to April. Um, I'm the leader on that. Is anyone signed up volunteer here? All right. I'm going to try to call um, so we can set up a meeting like on Tuesday or Thursday so we can set next month's schedule and try to do it that way. And then we can, we're kind of figuring this out as we go. So, um, and I thank everyone that did uh, volunteer for that. Um, also, um, Dawn Kirk, who was, she was here for a session. Her mother passed away. And they had a service last week. And she wanted me to read something to thank everybody. Um, glasses. Well, OK. Um, perhaps you sent a lovely card or sat quietly in a chair. Perhaps you sent a floral piece. If so, we saw it there. Perhaps you spoke the kindest words, as any friend could say. Perhaps you were not there at all just thought of us that day. Whatever you did to console the heart, we thank you so very much, whatever the part. And her mother was Betty, if, if you knew her, but she wanted me to read that to thank everybody, so. Um, also, uh, International Birthday Party for Jesus, December 22nd here at Hope. They have appetizers at 10 and a potluck at noon, so that should be good. So I guess that's it. So if everyone would just please stand up, meet somebody new, greet somebody old. Not old age, I mean old is, you know. I was gonna do that for Tom, he's not here. And another thing I can't figure out, this is the second time I have to do announcements for Tom. I don't know what's going on with him.
guys. Present art. Darkness tries to hide and trembles out. 
at his voice, trembles at his voice. Then proclaim. 
that saves my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. This is a great time of year as we think about thankfulness. But if you think about it, as believers, we gather each week to remember what we have to be thankful for. We are thankful for the cross, which brought us into a relationship with our Father in heaven. And we are thankful for the empty tomb, which brought us everlasting hope. <laughs>
what it will be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. I can only imagine. Church Second Service, you glad to be here today? Yeah. Man, we welcome you. We're glad that you're here. Also, if you're tuning in online and, and joining us, thank you for being here with us. Um, is Tammy and Jake in the house? Tammy and Jake? Oh, they did leave? Okay. Uh, I wanted to tell you all, there's a, there's a scripture in Acts, more than one actually, that talks about the body taking care of one another and uh, helping each other out. So there's an opportunity. They're selling belongings right now to help their physical, financial situation. And um, so if you're interested in doing some shopping, they're going to have a continuous garage sale. And uh, you're, you're welcome to, to help out with that. Um, see me and I'll get you connected with uh, their contact information. So uh, today we begin a new series uh, called Project. Well, it's called Thankful, but the, today is Project Thankful. I was thinking it'd be cool to do a couple of weeks on thankfulness as we prepare for Thanksgiving, and then we'll start a series on Christmas called He Came for Everyone, and then we'll celebrate the conclusion of that series the Sunday before Christmas. We'll have a 
international potluck since he came for everyone and uh, really praying that you guys are going to bring it on that. No, uh, so, uh, but uh, I, was on, I went on Facebook, I was thinking about this thankful theme and I found there's actually a page that's called the Thankful Pro- Project Thankful. And people started it with people just the idea of, of going through the habit, developing the habit of list, listing things you're thankful for. And, and I like the word project. You know, guys, when you got a project, you take it serious, right? And, and if a woman is on a project, get out of the way, right? <laughs> and project's a cool word. And uh, so what if we did a project in our own life where we took it seriously? It's how I'm going to work on being thankful. And so that's what this uh, is about. And um, I actually, point number one, have a selfish motivator for you. I'm going to read a couple articles under this. The first point is being thankful is actually healthy for me. It's healthy. People who are thankful are healthier. Here's a quote. Uh, Having a grateful attitude and positive outlook on life has a favorable effect on your health. If thankfulness were a drug, it would be the world's best-selling product with a health maintenance indication for every major organ system. That's from um, a uh, doctor at the head of the Division of Biological Psychology at Duke. And uh, then I have um, some other art. I was going to read to you that I uh, got that are kind, they're kind of long. Hang with me because I want you to hear what they have to say. Um, this, the first one says, uh, there are many reasons to practice being thankful consistently other than just during the month of November or at your Thanksgiving Day dinner. Scientists have found that people who practice being grateful regularly experience many health benefits, including one, smoother and coherent heart rhythms, reduced risk of cardiovascular disease, stronger immune systems, higher sense of attentiveness, alertness, and energy, less physical pain, longer, more restful sleep, that sounds good, amen, better able to handle stressful situations, healthier relationships with others, better physical fitness, fewer feelings of sadness and depression. To experience many of these benefits, try to become consciously aware of what you're thankful for in your life. There are ways you can do this. The key is to pick something that works for you and to stick with it. Some ideas you might try. One, write in a gratitude journal every night before you're going to bed. Number two, upon waking up in the morning, think about everything you are thankful for uh, before getting out of bed. Number three, see how many things you can think of to be grateful for and appreciate while doing one of your daily routines like brushing your teeth or taking your dog for a walk. Studies have found that people who focus on what they are grateful for every day for one week straight can experience the benefits up to a six month period. Let us take it a step further and share some of the things uh, you are thankful for. Oh, that's just another exercise they did online. This is another article from Robert Emmons a psychology professor at the University in Davis, uh, University of California. He's kind of a leading researcher in this growing field called positive psychology. And his research has found that those who adopt, quote, an attitude of gratitude as a permanent state of mind experience many health benefits. Emmons' findings, along with those from researchers such as Lisa Aspenwall, a psychology professor at the University of Utah, suggest that Grateful people may be more likely to take better care of themselves physically and mentally, engage in more protective health behaviors and maintenance, get more regular exercise, eat a healthier diet, have improved mental alertness, schedule regular physical examinations with their doctor, cope better with stress and daily challenges, feel happier and more optimistic, avoid problematic physical symptoms, have stronger immune systems, maintain a brighter view of the future. And then they, these scientists had a couple of uh, ideas to help. They said, focus attention outward. Your attitude plays a large role in determining whether you can feel grateful in spite of life's challenges. According to Emmons, gratitude is defined by your attitude towards both the outside world and yourself. He suggests that those who are more aware of the positives in their lives tend to focus their attention outside of themselves. Then they say, be mindful of what you have. You may assume that those with more material possessions have more to be grateful for. However, research suggests otherwise. 
Edward Daner, a psychology professor at the University of Illinois, found that a high percentage of affluent people in Japan report low levels of life satisfaction, just as those living in poverty in India do. These findings suggest that it's not how much you have, but how you feel about what you have that makes a difference. And then they also suggest keep a gratitude journal. Recording what you're grateful for in a journal in a, is a way to give thanks on a regular basis. Emmons found that those who listed five things they felt grateful for in a weekly gratitude journal reported fewer health problems and greater optimism than those who didn't. A second study suggests that daily writing led to a greater increase in gratitude than weekly writing. Then the last suggestion is reframe situations as positive. Maybe you know somebody that does this really good when others are going crazy. Um, it says, it's not actually a challenging situation that is upsetting. It's how you perceive the situation. The next time you find yourself complaining about life's hassles, see if you can mentally flip the switch to frame things differently. For example, rather than getting down about missing an opportunity, try to see the positive side. You might now have more time to direct towards other priorities. Uh, and, and so it goes on. So I, I wanted to read those to you because uh, it, these are people that are a lot smarter than me in universities that are studying this subject and they're researching people and they're finding things about them. And one of the things they're proving is that being thankful is good for your health. Okay, that's it for today. Thanks for being here. <laughs> now, it's interesting that a long time ago, before these universities came about, God, one of God's writers wrote Psalm 30, 11, 12, said, You turned my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy, that my heart may sing your praises and not be silent. Lord my God, I will praise you forever. I love that. I will praise you forever. That, there's always a reason to praise you. I will praise you forever. And so a lot of what we're dealing with today and learning on this project to be grateful is, is learning to develop, a, cultivate an attitude, isn't it? A mindset. And uh, some of us may be predisposed to be more optimistic. Some of us may be predisposed to be more pessimistic. But God calls us to be optimistic in, in being gra grateful. Amen. Uh, now, I'm going to tell two stories today that some of you have probably heard. If you've heard them, just kind of nod and act like you never heard it. Go, oh, this is great. Uh, the first one is about this optimist who goes to this pessimist friend. He says, let's go duck hunting tomorrow. And the pessimist says, oh, it'll probably rain. And the other says, no, 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 I'll come pick you up. So in the next morning, beautiful day, optimist pulls up, says, see, I told you, it's a great day. And the pessimist says, yeah, we probably won't see any duck. And he gets in the truck, they got their dog, and they head out in the boonies, and then they get out of the truck and hike back in, and they get around this marsh. And uh, the, uh, pretty soon, here come some ducks, but they're way off in the distance. And, oh, see, I told you we'd see some ducks. And the pessimist says, yeah, but they probably won't come close enough. But uh, after a while, here they came. They flew overhead, and they both unload their guns. You know, come on, come on. And a duck falls down, lands right out in front of them, but it's out in the water. And the pessimist says, should have known and land in the water. And the optimist says, don't worry, check this out. And he goes, Rover! And this dog trots up to him, and he goes, fetch! And Rover walks out on top of the water, <laughs> picks up the duck, turns around, walks back on top of the water, and lays the duck at his master's feet. And the optimist says, Haha, what do you think of that? And the pessimist says, your old dog can't swim, can he? <laughs> you know, there's some that just tend to always gravitate toward the negative, right? Uh, and they can be what I affectionately call uh, energy-depleting vortexes. You know, there's just nothing positive to look at. And God challenges us to take on this project. And I gave you a selfish motivator first. It's healthier for you. It's better for me. So we need to focus on it. But more than that, uh, it's something that God calls us. So I'm going to give you two things to help uh, from Scripture to help with being thankful in this project thankful. Number two is to be thankful, focus on who God is. Focus on who God is. That pessimist was focusing on the negative. Optimist, we're called to focus on who God is, his nature. There's something about the attributes of God. Look at these. Here's some writers that I put on your outline that talk about the attributes or the nature of God. First Chronicles 16, 34. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is, he's what? He is good, for his mercy endures, how long? forever. Uh, Psalm 1962, at midnight, I will rise to give thanks to you because of your righteous 
judgments. You ever get frustrated when you can't count on someone to make a right decision or to treat things correctly, or there's a question in integrity? Uh, the writer here is, is saying God is someone we can count on. He always gives righteous judgments. He can be trusted. 1 Corinthians 15 is dealing with the way our body uh, is going to one day be changed in the twinkling of an eye, but we're going to get a new body. I love thinking about that because of our brother Walt Hansford, who's, who's really struggling right now. His physical body is in a lot of pain, but someday he's going to get a new body that will last forever and ever is what Paul writes about. And he says because of the resurrection uh, that we overcome this death and we overcome this life. And that's what this writer's dealing with here. He says he gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so those are just some examples where the writers talk about the attributes of God. There's something about the names of God that help us understand the attributes of God, what God is like. You know, to the Hebrew mind, the name often meant something about the person. Like when Barnabas was called son of encouragement, it wasn't because his dad was Mr. Encouragement. It was because it was his na nature. He was an encourager. When James and John were called the sons of thunder, it wasn't because they uh, uh, read the book about how to win friends and influence people. They had thunderous personalities. They're the guys that were in a village that was unreceptive, and they said, Lord, do you want us at this time to ask God to rain down fire upon them? You know, it's like Jesus like, chill out. You know, let's don't get to... Uh, and uh, later, John would be called the apostle of love, which shows that Jesus can change your name. And uh, so the name in the Hebrew way of thinking means something. So I want to give you some Hebrew words for the name of God, different names that are used about God, which tell us about his nature. Like Elohim means God, mighty creator. He's not a God man thought up. He's not an idol. He's not. He's God almighty, the creator, everything that's been created. El Ra uh, means the God who sees me. That's only used once and it's in the story about Hagar, remember, uh, those of you who remember in the Old Testament that you've read about Abraham and Sarah, uh, Sarah, Ab Abram is told they're going to have all these kids, and there's only one problem. He's around 100, and they have none, and uh, he's going to have all these generations, and so they think they're going to help God out, and so Sarah says, sleep with my handmaiden, Hagar, and then we'll get this thing going here, and then there was frustration. That's what happens when you try to help God out, by the way. There's struggles afterwards, and uh, there's some harsh treatment, and Hagar is feeling alone and discarded. And an angel appears to her and tells her about her destiny and about her child and that there is a future. And she's the one that calls God El-Ra, the God who sees me. You ever feel alone? You remember that El-Ra sees you. He knows how many hair on your head. For some of us, it's easier than others. But he knows about your hurts or pains. Sometimes you feel discarded. Maybe you feel like you're not being noticed by anyone. You feel alone. El Ra, he sees you. He sees your pain. He sees your struggles, your hurts. He has a destiny for you. You're not a computer number on this huge computer in heaven. God, El Ra, sees you. El Shaddai means God Almighty. E, uh, Elohim, no, Elo Alam is the everlasting God. He's not a temporary God. Yahweh Yerah is the Lord will provide. Adonai is Lord Master. Yahweh Rafa is the Lord who heals. Yah, uh, Yahweh Nasi is the Lord my banner. Ancient armies would go out into war. Different nations would have a banner describing their nation or who they were, kind of like a flag, but it was a banner. And the Israel banner said, the God of Israel can defeat anything, anyone any enemy. There's no problem, no challenge too big for our God, Yahweh Nasi, the Lord my banner. Yahweh Shalom means the Lord is peace. Yahweh Tesuri is the Lord my rock. Isn't that great? Lord my rock. Uh, Yahweh Roy, the Lord my shepherd. You know, shepherd uh, takes care of the sheep. A shepherd feeds the sheep. A shepherd keeps them safe, leads them to safety. And they called uh, Yahweh, the, their shepherd. Malik means a king. Here's a good one. Husband. The word, the Hebrew word for husband is ish. Ish. Girls, do you ever look at your husband and go, ish? <laughs> now you know where it came from. To the Israelites, it's actually that they were taught that God is ish. God is your husband. 
who, and he woos you, and he goes after you, and he's romantic, and he wants you. God talked in romantic language in the Old Testament with the Israelites about going after his bride, and being jealous of his bride, and protecting his bride, and then that carries over in the New Testament, where Christ is the, the groom, and the church is the bride. Ish uh, is, our, is our husband. Then there's like five or six words, uh, meon, masha, megan, matsuda, Migdal and Oz, which mean kind of similar words. Dwelling place, refuge, shield, fortress, strong tower. Did you know you have a fortress? You have a strong tower. I keep this picture in the office on purpose uh, uh, because I think it, se- it shows staff what, and ministry leaders what it's like being in the ministry. It's this, this lighthouse with this huge waves crashing all over, and the guy's standing there in the doorway in the lighthouse. Maybe you guys have seen that. You know, when the storms are going, you're okay if you got Yahweh, if you got uh, Mayon, if you got uh, Mahashish, if you got the God who's my strong tower, my shield, my fortress. Uh, Mikwith, Israel, is hope of Israel. And then there's Abba. This God, this creator God, is our Father our loving, caring father, no matter what kind of father you had growing up biologically or in whatever, or didn't have with God. When you come to God, you have a loving father who cares for you. You can sit in his lap and you can have an intimate relation with your everlasting father. Why am I saying all that? Thinking about the names of God will help you and me to be thankful because we've got God. The third point is when you look, when you focus on looking at God, seeing God in others, it will help you be thankful. When you watch God at work in the lives of others, you, you can look at negativity and get bummed out, or you can look at God at work in the lives of others. There, here's the other story. There was a woman on her way to work, and she was walking by a pet store, and in the window there was a parrot, and the parrot goes, lady, you're ugly. And she's like, oh. She goes to work insulted and thinks about it all day long. You know how something can just bug you all day And she's like, wondering on her way back home, is he going to do it again? She gets to the store. Sure enough, there's the parrot. Lady, you're ugly. And she's like, oh, she runs into the store, finds the owner and says, if that bird insults me again, I'm going to wring its neck and I'm going to sue you. And he goes, okay, ma'am, we'll take care of it. And so the guy goes to work trying to calm the parrot down. She goes home. At night, she's wondering, what's it going to be like tomorrow, you know? So morning comes. She's on her way to work. Here we go. And she gets to the pet store, to the window, sees the bird. He sees her. And he goes, lady. And she goes, yes. And he goes, you know. (laughs) Sometimes things can really tick you off if you focus on them, right? Things people can really uh, be that energy depleting vortex or negative things can really drag. It's like they say what takes nine attaboys to equal one negative criticism, right? And some just look for fault like there's a reward in it. You know, and, and it's not hard to find fault with, hu- with human beings in a fallen world. It's actually pretty easy. To be positive and to be grateful is, is the challenge. And, and, and what will help us, I think, what helps me, and too, is, is looking at God at work in the lives of others. And you see passages that kind of tell us that example. 2 Corinthians 8, 16, But thanks be to God who puts the same earnest care for you into the heart of Titus. Titus was a guy Paul trained in the ministry, and Titus cared about this church. And Paul was thanking God that he saw this young guy who cared for the the Christians and helping the church. I got this random call this last week. I say random because I didn't expect it. But it was a young guy that I got to study with and baptize years ago who came from a broken home in a tough situation, didn't have anything handed to him, became a, a, a hard worker in the insurance industry, ma- making a lot of money in Silicon Valley. Uh, and he has now gone into the ministry, gave up his job, and he's involved with ministry. And he was sharing these places. He's been teaching and stuff that he's doing. And uh, we cried and laughed and prayed together. And I hung up. And I was just like, wow. Oh, my God, that was awesome. I had no idea back then what you were going to do in this guy's life and what you're doing right now. Sometimes you see God at work in others, and it causes you to praise God, to thank God. There's a verse I absolutely love. I can't remember where it's at. Read the whole New Testament. You'll find it. I think it's in Philemon. But Paul says, or no, Paul's in Galatians talking about how he went from persecutor to proclaimer, where the people, the Christians saw how he radically changed. 
You know, he, he was like, is this mission impossible? He was killing us, and now he's acting like he's one of us, you know? But then they saw her legitimately really tra- changed and was a believer, and, it said, and he said, he writes this, and they praised God because of me. He's not bragging. He's saying, because they saw God, what he did in my life, they praised God. Here's another example, 1 Corinthians 1, 4. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God, which was given to you by Christ Jesus. We don't get to decide who's going to accept that gift of grace, do we? We pray for people and we share. And sometimes the ones we think they're really going to go for it don't. We're like, ah. And sometimes some we may at least expect they become believers and followers of Jesus. And it's so awesome when you see someone uh, become a believer. And, th- and that's a good thing to focus on, people who are coming to Christ and getting to know God. In 2 Thessalonians 1, 3 and 4, uh, Paul wrote to the church there, we ought always to thank God for you. How often? He says, always thank God for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more. And the love of all all you have for one another is increasing. Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials you are enduring. I I love that he says, uh, we're praising because of the way your faith is growing and growing. That shows our faith can grow. And the way your love is increasing. Did you know our love can increase more and more? It can decrease and our hearts get hard, or it can increase. We can grow in our faith, stepping out, taking on challenges, to, and following God, even through tough circumstances. They were going through difficult circumstances, and he says that they're growing. And, and he even says, we brag about you to the other churches. You know, it's, it's okay to be a model church. He calls them a model church in Thessalonica. Here's one of the ways you and I, we can be a model church by taking Project Thankful serious, by being full of of gratitude and being full of ever-increasing love and faith, stepping out on faith. And people, wow, that whole church, they're just fired up. You know, they're not, you know, let's just face it. There's some Christians that uh, are very, very much uh, sourpusses. They're very negative, very critical. You know, Uh, they sing, oh, how I love Jesus. I want to yell out, tell your face. Tell your face you love Jesus, you know? And, uh, and, and just because we've been dunked in some water or something doesn't mean, oh, well, all of a sudden we've just, we've got it all down and we can be the sour, po- you know, we're saved by grace. I get that, but it ought to impact our heart and our face and, and, our, and our, our gratitude. I think I'm preaching. Let's go on. Uh, Philippians 4. <laughs> Philippians 4. This had a big impact on me as a young guy. He still does. Um, he says in... And he's in jail when he writes this, okay? And he's writing to Christians who are going through tough time, difficult situation. And he says in Philippians 4, verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord. How often? Always. Always. He's so all-inclusive. You can see tempted to say, yeah, but Paul, you don't understand how things are going right now. You know, we're, we're being persecuted. My aunt last week was burned at a stake at, at Nero's garden party, you know? Uh, we're going through horrible things just because we say Jesus is Lord and not Caesar is Lord. And then he would go, oh yeah, but Paul's in prison. And it looks like his head may land in a Roman basket, which the tradition says eventually did. He says, rejoice in the Lord. Always? I will say it again. He's like being emphatic. In case you don't get it, rejoice! Exclamation point. Let your gentleness be evident to all. That word gentleness is interesting because it's translated different things in English versions. Sometimes get, get different versions around you and... Uh, read what that verse says, what that word. You'll find words like um, forbearance. Let your forbearance be evident to all. What I get from it, what I read from it is, I think he's kind of like saying, your attitude. There's like 16 or 17 times in this little letter he uses the word rejoice or joy, a synonym. And here he says, let your gentleness be evident to all. Let your forbearance be known. Let your steadfastness be known. Let your attitude be known to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about what? Anything? Anything? Oh. But in what? Everything by prayer and petition with what? Thanksgiving. Present your request to God. That's what my Graham taught us who went, came from a depression after her 12th kid died. Her husband died young. She moved out here from Oklahoma after practically giving everything away. 
and they got jobs in the fields and worked hard, and when any of them would complain or get negative, Graham would say, count your blessings. And then when I came into the scene and my, my sibs and my mom would talk to us, if we were fussing, my mom would say, count your blessings. You know, we'd be out raking leaves, count your blessings, you know. And it was such good teaching from Graham because it influenced us all. To, to, no matter how tough things are, if you, you still can be thankful. You can still find things to be thankful for. And that's what Paul says here. In your request, with your needs, with the things you're focused on, do it with thanksgiving, present your request. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. My mom right now can't breathe very good, and they've got her doing oxygen now. And she doesn't want to do it. She doesn't like that thing on her ears and nose. She fusses about it, but she can't do anything. And I was talking to my brother about it, and the frustrating thing about it is she's taking care of herself and her. She's always been this tiny little thing. Her muscles are good. She fell at a, tra a train station last year and didn't break a bone. She's never broke a bone. If she could breathe, she'd be bouncing off the walls at 80 years old, but she can't breathe. And it could make you mad. You think about that and focus on that. But she knows Adonai. She knows Elohim. She knows Yahweh. She has a stronghold that's more important than this life. And I went in to see Walt this week. You know, a decorated warrior. Shot in one hip, came out the other. The Battle of the Bulge in a lot of pain. And uh, I just felt so bad for him. You know, hurting. Here he is at the end of his life. He served so many people and helped people and loved people. And here he is in pain. And uh, kind of put my arms around him from the back of him. And I kind of started to sing to him a little bit, which probably didn't help. Maybe helped to agitate him more. But I just felt led to do that. Kind of hum to him until I love you, you know. And, and I was thinking to myself, if these people in here knew who this guy was, what a giant of a man. Right now he's moaning in pain. And it can be very frustrating. And I thought, ah, but he knows. He like me. He knows Yahweh. He knows a shelter. He knows the God who is my strong tower. He's on his way to be with him forever, ever, ever. And he'll get a new body. One day, uh, he'll exchange that body. There's just a peace that come over me, thinking about that victory that he has ahead. You know, uh, one time when I was here, hadn't been here very long, we had flags all over the place. We had a flag in the entry. We had a flag on the stage. We had a flag back there where I wanted to put the logo, and there's nothing wrong with that. I love our country. I love our flag. But I felt like, you know, I don't want the place to look like it's a, a political rally that we're in. Are you with me? And uh, so I was real timid about this with Walt, who was on the board, because I was like, I I'd like to remove a couple. Uh, you know, I'm okay with one being there, but I don't think we need them everywhere. And uh, how are you guys? And I'm thinking of all people, someone wounded in battle, a decorated veteran might say, hey, wait, what are you, you know? And he says, take them down. We're not here for that. We're here to worship the God of the universe. I was like, and well, amen. There's no borders. We love our country, but there's no borders in the kingdom of God. We're here to worship God. And there's a peace that comes over you when you go to God. Paul says, go to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Then he says, finally, brothers, Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, uh, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. New, I think it's New American Standard says, let your mind dwell on these things. When you look in the original Greek, it's written as a command. He's not saying, you might perhaps want to consider thinking about these things. He's writing it as a command. Whatever is true, whatever is lovely, whatever is beautiful, whatever is positive, whatever is good, let your mind dwell, marinate, soak your mind on the positive. And then he says, um, and the God of, oh, he says, put it into practice what you've seen into me. There's that project. We got to practice it. Some of us uh, tend to be more positive naturally. Some of us were born grumps and we're still grumps. And we, it's a little harder, but we all got to learn to practice it because we get beat around and it's a fallen word in those tough circumstances. And then he says it again, and the God of peace will be with you. And then he, he talks about rejoicing about them and their concern and so forth. 
And then he says this in verse 11, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. He didn't sing Mick Jagger's song, I Can't Get No Satisfaction. Verse 12, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned. Notice it's something we can learn. That's why a project can work. It's something we can learn. The secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I, here's the secret, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He's not saying I can do a bazillion push-ups. He's saying I can endure any situation through Christ who strengthens me. I have joy. They can't beat it out of me. They can't jail it out of me. They can't whip it out of me. I've got joy, and I can endure all situations through Christ who strengthens me. So I thought I was feeling thankful, so thankful, and I thought, I think I'm going to write something on my Facebook. I hadn't posted anything in a while. I wrote on there uh, something you guys hear me talk about a lot. About a little over three years ago, 40 desperate people holding on to a church, wanting to grow. And I was desperate, wanting to be a part of a church that wanted to get outside the walls and reach out to the community. And God brought us together. And now today, there's people that helped us from the outside. This is one of the reasons I wrote this, because there's friends on that Facebook that helped us. And I want them to know how thankful I am. I said, and today, the church is now self-supported, and the church um, has um, started Rock the Ridge to go out and give to needs and the community and the church has a youth group battle cry that's going to target regional mission projects and the church uh, has a shore some homeless folks are staying in our building and the church is now connecting with seeds of hope in costa rica to fight sex traffic and i said uh, thank you so much for helping us and the last count it was like about a hundred almost a hundred people put like you can click like see they're praising god because of you what's going on here I want to show you a picture here from last, this is last night, thousands of teens gathered, it's called Winter Jam. It's a gathering in Sacramento, it only costs $10, which is amazing when you know the headline groups, they're amazing groups, and I got been blessed to see some, and I didn't pay $10, by the way, and uh, so it's really cool what they're doing, uh, Newsboys, all these great bands are there. The ones right there with their hands up, those are Hope Battle Cry teens right there, isn't that awesome? And we had, we had, is it 16 or 17 go, Rob? 26 total with the adults. 26 adults, but a 16 or 17. Anyway, uh, they gave a message during that time. And at the end, the guy said, if you would like to give your life to Christ, you can pray. I'm going to do a prayer, and you can pray with me. Or maybe you already believe, but you, you need to recommit your life to Christ. And he did a prayer. And then after that prayer, he said, if you just said that prayer, I'd like to ask you to stand up. And all of our teens stood up. Man, they stood up. See, you look hard enough, you can always find something to make you thank God to be thankful. Anybody can be a grumbling. It is so easy. That's why I want to punch grumps in the nose. It's so easy to be a grump. And I, I want to punch myself in the nose when I get grumpy. It's so easy. It's the chicken way out. It's the whiner way out. We serve Adonai. Our father is Yahweh. Elohim. He's the strong tower and our witness. So much of our witness to the world is our attitude. It's not our building. It's not how we look. It's not our net worth. It's our love and our, our joy. And people are going to go, wow. You got joy? Well, how did you get joy in this fallen world? If we're down, you're going, well, you got God, and you say life sucks. I don't have God, and I say life sucks. I guess I don't need your God. Don't you know those guards in Caesar's household were blown away by this Paul? He's in chains. They've got to go be chained to him. They're probably flipping coins you know, heads, you got to go be with Paul. Because you got to sit by Paul, you get to hear about Jesus over and over and over. And he writes in his letter that the saints at the household of Caesar send you a greeting. He had a hope group going on at Caesar's house. It's our witness. I say, let's blow it out, man. Let's be radically joyful. People say, oh, you're just sanguine. Oh, you're just naive. People say that to me, kind of stuff like that, too. Oh, you just want to celebrate. Oh, you just want to have fun. No, I met a God. 
30-something years ago who saved my soul and gave me meaning and purpose and the greatest job on the face of the earth. And every time I get down, I kick myself in the butt because God does that. God says that. God is Elohim. God is Yahweh. God is Adonai. God is the one who provides. God is hope. God is peace. God is the everlasting Father. So what do I have to whine about? Amen? Amen. Let's be joyful. Let's, uh, let's take this project seriously. And when one of us is is beaten up in this fallen world. Let's encourage each other to seek God because God can bring us that joy, amen? Let's, let's pray together. And, and as you're bowed and praying, I do not want to downplay any difficult thing you're going through right now. There's some real tough things that people are going through. I just want to encourage you to look to God and know that he is, he is God who sees you. He sees your pain and he cares about you, and he created you for a destiny. He's not done with you. That's why you're still here. He has a future for you, and you can put your trust and your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and follow him. And those of us that are believers, Lord, help us to be radically joyful, uh, not because of shallow things, surfacey things, um, but to be, uh, have some roots deep down in who you are, your nature, your attribute that cannot be taken away, that we will be joyful uh, to your glory. And one day, we can only imagine, Lord, one day we look forward to be with you forever and ever. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand together and worship. so I'm Now I'm left alone and I am Trying to find my way, I'm trying to find the faith that's gone. This time, I know that you are holding all the answers. I'm tired of losing hope and taking chances on a road I've never seen. Be the one that brings me home. Give me a revelation. Show me what to do. Cause I've been trying to find my way. Haven't got a clue. Tell me, should I stay here? Do I need to move? Give me a revelation. Got nothing without. Without you, my life has led me down this path that's ever winding. Through every twist and turn, I'm always finding that I am lost again. Tell me when this road will ever end. Give me a revelation. Show me what to do. Cause I've been trying to find my way. Haven't got a clue. Tell me, should I stay here? Or do I need to move? Give me a revelation. I got nothing without you. Got nothing without. Don't know where will I turn. Tell me where will I learn. Won't you show me where I need to go? Oh, let me follow your lead. I know that it's the only way that I can get back home. Give me a revelation. Show me what to do Cause I've been trying to find my way Haven't got a clue Tell me should I stay here Or do I need to move Give me a revelation Got nothing without you Got nothing without you Now it's time to pray for our offering. Let's pray.
Father, thank you that I get to work with some people who celebrate the idea of giving. Um, if there's anyone here going through financial difficulty, Lord, please help them not feel guilty, uh, but to just focus on giving their heart to you and bless them as they seek first the kingdom. Father, I pray for those of us that are members that are committed to the vision here to give as we prosper and that you will make us a force of hope for Jesus on the ridge and beyond until he comes. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen. Hey, before we give, what is our purpose? Building, Building relationships that last forever. How do we do that? Love God, love people. So remember, till next week, in Christ we always have hope. Thanks for being here.